This is an auto-narrated audiobook by Google's computer-generated AI voices. Off-Limits Mate Book 2 in the Brides for Beast Bear series by Candace Ayers and Kim Dillon Copyright 2023 by Lovestruck Romance All Rights Reserved Chapter 1 The sleek black dress is elegant in its simplicity. Couple it with a pair of silver earrings and it might just do the trick. I slip into it, arrange the fabric over my curves and catch my reflection. Hum. I chew my lip in contemplation. Not bad, Balin. You could almost pass for a discount drugstore Audrey Hepburn. I twirl once, then twice, before the grim reality hits me. It's not a 1960s-themed cocktail party. I'm trying to compete with a group of virtual supermodels. One more spin for Audrey, then it's off with a dress. You know what they say about trying on clothes. It's fun until it's not. And right now, surrounded by a textile tornado, the vote is leaning toward not. I stare down my opponent, a full-length mirror with too much honesty and not enough tact. The silence in the rustic log cabin is only broken by the occasional sound of a discarded hanger hitting the floor. Confidence, that's the key. Yet, there I am again, second-guessing my outfit. But honestly, some of these women in the program look like they walked right off the cover of Vogue. Against them, I'm like an adorable penguin stranded in the Sahara. I mean, a little bit of wardrobe warfare can't hurt. Next contender, a casual jeans and blouse combo. Hum. I add a scarf, thinking maybe I'll look artsy. The mirror says I look like a soccer mom. Okay, okay. I wave a flag of surrender to my reflection. We need a different approach. With a renewed sense of determination, I rifle through my suitcase for another dress, something that screams potential bride, not help, I've lost my way to the zoo. I find a deep red dress and pair it with delicate gold accessories. It's loose but somehow alluring. It hides what needs hiding, shows what needs showing, it's the perfect middle ground. Except, I catch my reflection again, and there's a niggling doubt at the back of my mind. Am I too? My gaze drops to my midsection. Fat. Nope, don't go there, Balin. But seriously, here I am like some desperate, chubby Cinderella, frantically hoping to land myself a hubby before the clock strikes midnight. It's a crazy plan. Marrying a stranger and, well, consummating said marriage as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, no, not the best of ideas, but sometimes the best ideas are just that, ideas. This is survival. A tendril of guilt slithers through me. If I'm successful, this won't be fair to the guy. If you're successful, I say to my mirror self. That's a big if. But succeed I must. Because a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. Fair or unfair, right? I take one final look, smoothing out the fabric of the red dress over my hips, tilting my head in contemplation. Yes, this is it. This dress and I, we're about to take the BFB grooms by storm. I lock eyes with my reflection, but what I see looking back is not confidence, it's worry and unease. Forget him. He didn't deserve you, and he can't touch you if he can't find you. A sigh escapes me as I think about L.A. The city of angels where I fell from grace. I've got nothing left there, no job, no second chances, nothing. But what I long for isn't a city of angels, it's stability and safety. A place to call home. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding. I've got to believe that everything is going to work out. Hopes high, I step out of the cabin. This is it. Let's do this, Balin. Let's go find a husband. Chapter 2 I've died and gone to heaven. Waylon slaps a hand on my shoulder as we enter the cocktail party. I don't disagree. My dream of having a marriage like my parents have has always been elusive. Now with this BFB program, my dream is finally within reach. This place. My gaze roves over the veritable ocean of human femininity at the cocktail party. A feast for the eyes. Hernan follows my gaze. Oh, more than the eyes, my friend. More than the eyes. Lake looks overwhelmed. How are we ever going to choose? My eyes land on an ebony goddess, towering above a curvaceous blonde next to a pair of large busted identical twins. I have no idea. Well, gentlemen. Silas urges. Time to mingle. I can't help but grin as I beeline it to the tall, dark-skinned woman whose dress clings to her like a second skin. Hello. I must say, I begin, eyeing the gorgeous group of women, 
I'm a little overwhelmed by all the beauty here. Corny, but what the hell? The women outnumber the men three to one tonight. I can afford to be corny. The blonde giggles. Her hand lightly touches my arm. Oh, we can't have that. Her touch is pleasant, and I find myself mirroring her grin. What do you suggest then? A look of mock seriousness crosses her face. We could. Take turns. Her suggestion causes a burst of laughter to ripple through the group. The twins exchange a glance before chiming in unison. Oh, we could share. The tall woman shakes her head, her demeanor sultry and seductive. Ladies, ladies, let's not be greedy. This is like being in the middle of a game of tug of war, where I'm the rope. And quite honestly, it's an awesome place to be. Yes, ladies, no need to squabble. There's plenty of me to go around. The blonde bursts into giggles, her fingers dancing over my arm like she's playing the piano. You're quite the charmer, aren't you? I flash her my most charming grin. Just trying to keep up with you, darling. If I get any cheesier, I might turn into a block of cheddar. The twins, on the other hand, are working as a coordinated unit, bouncing back and forth like a well played tennis match. We could. One starts, then glances at her sister. Show you the time of your life. The other finishes, both their eyes twinkling mischievously. As their laughter fills the air, my gaze travels to the towering beauty, still a good five or so inches shorter than me. She carries herself with an abundance of poise and confidence, and arches a brow before a wicked smile crosses her face. I'm not the sharing type. My god, this evening is turning out to be the highlight reel of my existence. These ladies are like bees to honey, fawning, giggling, blushing, it's payback for all those dry years. It has to be. I've been with women, we all have, but only on the rare occasion we travel to human cities and towns. And when we do, we don't stay long. It's always been frowned upon to fraternize with humans. Which is why this BFB program is a dream come true. One of the twins, I'm having a hard time telling them apart, whispers something in my ear that would make even a seasoned sex worker blush. Careful, I warn with a grin, I might just take you up on that. The blonde bless her heart is keeping up the pace. You're not like other men. She purrs, tracing the edge of my collar with her finger. I'm one of a kind, sweetheart. I wink at her. The tall beauty remains more aloof, but her eyes hold an unmistakable come-hither message. As I weave my way through flirty comments and seductive glances, a thought worms its way into my head. What if I want to have my cake and eat it too? I love the thought of the marriage thing, just not the one-woman part. Maybe I could start a harem. The idea lodges itself in my brain. The more I look at these women, a smorgasbord of strong, beautiful, unique femininity, I wonder, why choose? My eyes dance over the crowd, and what they land on is a sight to behold. She's the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. It's as if someone suddenly pulls the plug on a chatty, giggly, flirty soundtrack, and everything around me dims to a hushed whisper. She's. Wow. She's standing in the corner next to another woman, a drink in her hand and a far-off look in her eye. She doesn't notice me. There's an ethereal beauty about her, like a work of art, a beautiful painting or a magnificent landscape, something so captivating you can't help but stare at it. Her hair is chestnut, her eyes are hazel, and while the other women in the room are all attractive, this woman is a level above, she's exquisite in a way that makes my heart trip over itself. My bear comes to life, pawing my insides and sniffing the air. She's the one. Look at me. Come on, look at me. She doesn't notice me, but her friend does. I want to go over there, but my whole body is frozen. I'm obsessed. She has to be mine. I have to make that woman mine. One of the twins tugs at my arm, saying something about a dance. Yeah. Sure. Dance. Go ahead, I mumble, my gaze never leaving the enchanting vision in the corner. The blonde attempts to rekindle my attention by batting her lashes, leaning closer and pouting. Xandros, you're not listening to me. Aha, is all I manage, still entranced by the captivating woman. It's like a punch to the gut, a shock to the system, a taser to the genitals. This sudden gravitational pull is unfamiliar and frighteningly intense. Every logical thought, every fleeting consideration about harems fades to oblivion. I see only her. Chapter 3 Never in my life have I felt so out of place. Handsome men strut through the venue like gods walking the earth, Adonis specimens, all chiseled jaws and bulging muscles. 
the women swarming them like flies on shit are equally as beautiful. It's like I accidentally walked into a model convention. And here I am, the awkward piece of celery in an otherwise gourmet spread. Surely there's a catch. What would men like these be doing in an arranged marriage program? Are they secret serial killers? I hope not but beggars can't be choosers. Pulling myself together, I scan the room for someone who doesn't look like they walked off the cover of a romance novel and see a woman standing alone in a corner. She's wearing a simple blue dress that matches her kind eyes and she looks as out of place as I feel. I approach her, plastering a smile on my face. Hi, I'm Balin. Hey. She returns my smile and adds a small wave. Alice. Alice is cute but not one of the supermodels here. She's more like me, average. I lean in. Is it just me or is this like an episode of The Bachelor? Alice laughs, nodding in agreement. I was thinking the same thing. How are these guys single? I know. Surely there must be something wrong with them. Maybe they have third nipples. We both eye the delicious menagerie. Maybe they fart uncontrollably in their sleep. She giggles. Maybe they're secretly werewolves. Don't say that. Alice's smile falls and her eyes widen in horror. I totally overlook extra nipples and smelly gas but werewolves. Her whole body shudders in revulsion. Don't even joke about something like that. Well it's hard not to feel a bit. Intimidated. Alice sighs and shakes her head. You're not the only one. I feel like a dandelion in a field of roses. Same. But I pat Alice's arm reassuringly and try to offer some words of comfort, for myself as much as for her. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I down the rest of my drink, then notice Alice's eyes widening in a peculiar way. What is it? She leans closer, her voice a conspiratorial whisper. Well, speaking of boulders, one hasn't taken his eyes off you in the last five minutes. I almost choke. Are you serious? As a heart attack, Alice nods in the direction behind me. And he's making his way over. My stomach flips. He's coming over here. I turn around. Who? Alice just gives me a comforting pat on the shoulder. You've got a beholder beauty. Sure enough, a man is elbowing his way through the crowded room straight to me. And he's take your breath away gorgeous. Cue my heart thumping like a bongo drum. His eyes are latched onto me as he elbows his way through the crowd of women. Hello. I'm Xandros. The hunky Greek god of a man stares at me as though he's starving and I'm a steak dinner. Are his eyes glowing? Hi. I swallow down the butterflies. Nice to meet you. I'm Balin. The pleasure is all mine. He grins, and I swear I fight the sudden urge to get all swoony and fan away the vapors. His eyes crinkle at the corners in a way that tells me he's smiling under his rugged beard. Balin. He repeats as though testing the word on his tongue. I swear if he keeps looking at me like he wants to devour me whole, I might just pass out cold. His eyes fall to my empty glass. Can I get you another? Sure. I shrug. Club soda. The moment he turns and heads to the bar, I wonder if I've screwed up by letting him leave. I turn to Alice but she's gone. Odds are so is Xandros. But Xandros returns faster than seems humanly possible given the fact that not only does he bring club soda, a pitcher of it, but he also has two plates, each piled a foot high with hors d'oeuvres. He ushers me over to a small table and places both plates, a clean glass and the pitcher of club soda in front of me. He's attentive. Like, really attentive. He seats himself in the other chair after moving it so it's flush up against mine. Try this. It's a crab puff. Xandros feeds it to me, yes, feeds it to me. I should probably be all sensual and seductive and suck his finger or something, but I'm hungry. And awkward. What do I even say to this man? I should have prepared something, an introduction, flirty pickup lines, something. You must enjoy being the center of attention. It looked like you were compiling a personal harem with all the women hanging on you. Smooth Balin. Real smooth. Your seduction skills are subpar. Xandros makes a choking sound. Harem? He grins sheepishly. Actually, no. That's not my style. Not at all. Really? Because his ex harem is mean, mugging me as we speak. He flashes me a warm smile. I'm definitely a one-woman kind of guy. He holds a stuffed mushroom to my lips. 
Here. Try this. I have to admit, he seems genuinely interested in me and only me. Either that or he's a great actor. He feeds me crab puffs, salmon croquettes, mushroom caps, and a whole other assortment of finger foods, and yes, he continues to feed them to me like I'm a child. Hey, who am I to complain? I open my mouth for a prosciutto-wrapped fig, those suckers are delicious, when a curly-haired brunette saunters up to us, giving Xandros a come-hither look that probably has most men eating out of her palm. Xandros doesn't even blink, just raises a brow. Sorry, I'm kind of in the middle of a very important conversation here. Her mouth drops open slightly before she mumbles something about seeing him later and slinks away, her ego visibly dented. I can't help but stare at Xandros, utterly dumbfounded. Why do you keep doing that? A smile plays on my lips. Doing what? Brushing off other women like that. I gesture to the still sulky brunette. I told you, I'm a one-woman kind of guy. I don't want to be distracted from my woman. His words cause a sudden rush of warmth to bloom in my core. I mean come on, who wouldn't be shocked when a guy like Xandros turns away an avalanche of beautiful women for her, each one more eager than the last. It's like I've suddenly been catapulted to the top of the mystic hollow social ladder. A leggy blonde sidles up next to him, her eyes flashing a clear message. But he barely glances at her before turning his focus back to me. Sorry, what were you saying? He asks me, his eyes never leaving mine. I, um, I fumble my words. Shocked. I nod toward the blonde who's now huffing in annoyance. Ignore her. He waves a hand in the air. Please go on. Every time another woman tries to intervene, he gently but firmly dismisses them. A curvy redhead bats her eyelashes and practically hangs onto his arm. But again his gaze stays fixed on me, his interest undeterred. I'm giddy with delight, I won't lie. This BFB program is looking like a stroke of genius right now. And I have to admit, I actually like Xandros, more so with each passing moment. He's attentive. Kind. Funny. And hotter than hellfire. He's the complete package. As the party starts to wind down, an idea begins to simmer in my mind. He's still with me, leaning in close, his eyes sparkling with interest. Should I? Should I invite him back to my cabin? We could continue our conversation. Or maybe, do a little more than just talk. I weigh my options quickly. Be bold, Balin. Go big or go home. The thing is, I can't go home, so I take a deep breath and turn to him. Xandros, the look in his eyes tells me he's eagerly awaiting my next words. Here's hoping I don't regret this. Chapter 4 Call me Cupid's latest victim because I am officially hooked. Enchanted. Arrow through the heart smitten. Every other woman in the room is just dim candlelight to Balin's blazing sun, there's no comparison. I'd happily trade the endless parade of ready and willing women just to spend another minute with her. Yeah, I'm that serious. Something keeps bothering me about her scent though. It's not unpleasant. She has an intoxicating aroma, a blend of vanilla and fresh rain laced with something else. Something I can't place. There's this faint, almost untraceable undertone. Or maybe not. Perfumes, especially the strong heady ones sting and burn shifter nostrils, and the fragrances wafting off the women here tonight are doing a number on my nose. I'm going to suggest the BFB band synthetic fragrances. Opt for something natural. Lavender, maybe. So, Balin asks around bites of jumbo shrimp. I have a question. I'm curious about something. Go ahead, ask me anything. Why are you in the BFB program? I mean, none of these guys tonight look like they should be hard up for women, and you could have any woman you want. Why an arranged marriage? I know you and the other women toured the town this morning. I'm not sure if you noticed, but there aren't many women in Mystic Hollow. Yeah, now that you mention it, we did notice that. So the BFB program is a way to bring women to town? Something like that. How about you? What made you decide to put your name in the hat as a bride candidate? I find myself trying to pinpoint that scent. Is it fear? Nervousness? Or something else? It's subtle. Tantalizing and slightly. I can't quite put my paw or finger on it. Maybe it's just my perfume singed nose hairs. I was tired of LA, tired of the big city and tired of being single. Seems to me you could have any man you set your sights on and there's no shortage of men in LA. 
I volley her own words back to her and regret it when a look of sorrow crosses her features. So instead of waiting for an answer, I feed her a goat cheese crostini. Balin has had me spellbound since the moment I spotted her across the crowded room. I know the evening is winding down and most of the guests have already left, but I don't want our time together to come to a close. She opens her mouth as though about to say something, but all that emerges is my name before she closes it again. I see a flicker of something in her gaze like she's weighing her words, but then she hesitates, her eyes darting away nervously. Curiosity peaked and patience non-existent, I ask, can I walk you back to your cabin? A quick flash of surprise passes over her face before she smiles and nods. The night's fresh air greets us as we exit the venue, bringing relief to my still confused nostrils. The town of Mystic Hollow is a beautiful place, but everything looks new and different with this woman walking beside me. So, what do you do back in LA? I ask Balin as we stroll the short distance to the campground. I was a, I mean I am a paralegal. I work in a huge firm that specializes in contract law. Again she sounds sad, wistful maybe. That sounds like an interesting job. She just shrugs. All her answers tonight, whenever we discuss anything personal, sound a bit off, like they were rehearsed beforehand. Maybe a lie. Maybe partial truth. But I can't expect her to spill all her deep dark secrets the same night she meets me. Even though I want her to. I want to know everything there is to know about this woman. I want her to open up to me because I will guard every one of her secrets like a priceless treasure. How about you? What do you do? Ah, I work in local government. It's not a lie. Not totally. I'm the clan enforcer but I can't exactly tell her that. And my job is, by loose definition, a government position. All too soon we reach her cabin. Balin. I clear my throat trying to sound casual while my bear is slamming against my insides. She turns to me, her eyes gleaming in the moonlight. I'd like to kiss you goodnight. Well, Zandros. A flirty twinkle appears in her eyes. I'm a firm believer in test drives. Make it a good one, and I might invite you inside for more than just a kiss. A surge of exhilaration pulses through my veins. Challenge accepted. As I lean in about to taste her lips, it hits me like a gut punch from a heavyweight champ. Her scent. It's not perfume, not perspiration, not singed nose hairs, not any of the things I tried to attribute it to earlier. It's clear as day now. I feel as though I've been struck by lightning. My mind buzzes with a chaotic flurry of thoughts, questions, and a whole lot of disbelief. Her delicate features twist into a frown. Confusion swims in her eyes. Zandros? The earth has shifted beneath my feet. Her challenge is forgotten as the weight of my discovery settles on me. The woman I'm captivated by, the woman I've been fantasizing about, is... I leap back like I've been burned, my heart pounding against my ribcage like a runaway freight train. What's wrong? Her voice carries the sharp edge of rising panic. Words stick in my throat. My mind grapples for purchase. I try to find the right words. Kind ones. Tactful ones. Avoidant ones. But truth has a funny way of insisting it be heard, no matter how brutal it is, and the truth tumbles out of my mouth unceremoniously. You're with child. Chapter 5 The words hang heavily in the air between us. Damn it, I knew this red dress made me look fat. I should have gone with the Audrey Hepburn look. Xandros is gazing at me, eyebrows furrowed as if he's trying to solve a Sudoku puzzle. I swallow the lump in my throat and opt for indignation as a defense mechanism. You think I'm pregnant because I'm what, a little thick around the middle. My hands plant themselves on my hips, conveniently pushing the fabric of my dress forward to poof out in front and hopefully camouflaging my slightly protruding belly. I'm not pregnant. I'm curvy. I try not to think about the guilt, gnawing at my conscience for flat out denying my little bun in the oven. His gaze flickers down then back to my face. He opens his mouth as if to say something but then shuts it again. His lips twitch in a semblance of a smile but his eyes. His eyes hold a different story. I have to force myself to break eye contact and when I do, my hand automatically moves to rest on my stomach, as if to reassure the tiny life inside me. His gaze dips to my belly and his jaw clenches. Realizing what I'm doing, I swiftly drop my hand to my side, cursing internally. You've got to be kidding me, Balin. Stop waving the maternity flag. 
The man looks like he just got blindsided by a semi. It's a look of utter devastation. What the hell? Balin. He starts, and I brace myself for whatever's coming next. But nothing does. He stops speaking as abruptly as he started. He just stares at me with sad eyes. Cue awkward silence 2.0. Finally, his shoulders sag as he takes a step back like my existence has suddenly become too much gravity for him to bear. I... I'm just... I'm going to go. Good night. With that he turns on his heel and saunters off, the gravel crunching under his boots. As I watch his retreating figure, I'm doused in a cloud of fear and uncertainty so thick I'd need a meat cleaver to slice through it. Okay, little bun, I whisper into the silence, rubbing my bump. Mommy may have royally screwed up this evening, but that doesn't mean we're down and out. Letting out a defeated sigh, I trudge into my cozy cabin and exchange my red dress for a comfy oversized shirt. I'm going to figure this out, I tell my tiny bump. There's no way he could know I'm pregnant. It had to be a lucky guess. A small town of wealthy, eager to marry men and I had to go and get the attention of one who, who what? Just happened to guess right? I'm not even that big yet. At this point it's more bloat than baby. Well there are other fish in the BFBC. As long as Xandros doesn't go around flapping his gums and spreading unsubstantiated rumors. I lie on my bed, staring at the ceiling as I mentally flip through the catalog of potential BFB grooms. We'll find someone who likes sunsets and board games, maybe even someone who can cook. I give a wry laugh. A man who can cook, now that's a dream. The world outside is silent, a still canvas awaiting the first light of dawn. Inside, as my mind buzzes with the names and faces of men from the party, my thoughts circle around to the one face I'm trying hard to scrub for my thoughts. I promise, little bun, I murmur, tracing the curve of my belly. Mommy's going to take care of everything. I fall asleep with my hand on my belly, my silent vow to my unborn child like a lullaby. I will find a husband in this town. Even if it's not Xandros. Especially if it's not Xandros. Should have stayed in bed, little bun, I mutter to my belly, feigning interest in a picnic table's wood grain. I shovel another bite of potato salad in my mouth, while trying to ignore Xandros's posse of giggling women, who keep draping themselves all over him at the BFB picnic. Blonde hair, dark hair, curly straight, they're all there, hanging on his every word. Why do they have to be so close to me? A frisbee is being tossed back and forth, so I stare at that for a while. My heart aches. Holly giggles at something Xandro says, her laugh echoing across the clearing. I roll my eyes. Sounds like a hyena on helium, I grumble. Ducking my head, I slide my gaze over to them. Xandros isn't watching Holly. He's watching me. Why does he keep staring at me? All right, Balin, I whisper under my breath, game face on. Setting my jaw, I rise. It's now or never. Summoning my courage, I stride over to the group, bristling at the women's outfits. Crop tops so short underboobs are on display and daisy dukes that don't quite cover asses. Sheesh, I'm way overdressed. Xandros hasn't taken his eyes off me. Xandros, can we talk? In private. Didn't you monopolize him enough last night? Megan sneers, her red-painted lips curving into a smirk. It's important. I stare imploringly at Xandros. Holly snorts. Desperate much? Before I can respond, Xandro steps forward, his imposing figure blocking them from my view. After you. He gestures. He follows me to a table where we have some respite from bare midriffs and butt cheeks. I turn to him, a rehearsed speech on the tip of my tongue. But when his eyes meet mine, my carefully constructed eloquent speech flies out of my head and what replaces it is a jumbled wordy mess. Could we just pretend you didn't pull a Moripovich on me last night and declare Balin, you are pregnant, to an audience of me and you? His gaze flicks to my stomach, then back to my face. He opens his mouth, probably ready to launch into an apology, but I'm on a roll. And can your harem possibly tone it down or find someone else to hang on to? I throw a thumb over my shoulder at the giggling group. Their fake laughter is giving me a headache. His lips twitch, a spark of amusement in his eyes. You're jealous. My face burns. Jealous? Ha. Huh. As if. Get over yourself. You're not that special. His face breaks into a wide grin and I want to smack him, but this is important to me, to our, little bun and my future. 
I am not pregnant, I'm well-rounded. I hiss. And I'd appreciate it if you'd stop body shaming me. Well-rounded? I'm fat, okay? It's not cool to go around fat shaming women. Shaming? His gaze roams down my body with such intensity, the look sends a flush over my skin, warming me in places I don't expect. You're perfect. Your figure is absolutely perfect, Balin. His confession, combined with that heated look, sets off an explosion of fireworks inside me. Perfect. I mumble. My heart flip-flops, my mind freezes, and my stomach, it does cartwheels like an Olympic gymnast. Damn this man for making me feel like this. The air between us sparks, and for a moment, I forget all about the giggling women, the crowd, and the secret I'm trying to safeguard. My nipples pebble and a rush of moisture leaks into my panties. Xandra's head tips back slightly and his nose twitches as though he's sniffing the air. His hands ball into fists at his sides and his jaw clenches. He stares at me with a look of such intense longing, I feel as though I might just melt into a puddle of goo in the grass. Then. He shakes his head, turns on his heel and strides off. Seriously, what the hell is up with this guy? Chapter 6 Don't leave her. She's the one. My bear demands I stay with Balin, but I ignore him. I stride off because I have to. The scent of her arousal is in the air, and I was a split second away from throwing her over my shoulder, marching her off to a secluded spot, and pleasuring her until she can't see straight. Yes, do it. My fucking bear needs to shut the fuck up. The best thing I can do for Balin and her unborn baby is to leave them alone. My mind is spinning. I'm not sure what to make of all this. I don't return to the women I was talking to earlier. Holly waves at me, a bright smile on her face. She's got legs for days, but she can't hold a candle to Balin. None of them can. I sink into a chair at the picnic area, alone, to contemplate fate's morbid sense of humor. A cluster of women chatter animatedly as they approach, but I send them a look so vicious they veer off in another direction. You need to find yourself another woman. Get over her, I mutter under my breath, trying to put on a smile. My bear adamantly rejects the notion, and I don't really blame him. Leaning back in my solitary chair, I stare at the sky. She's supposed to be with her mate, her baby's father. I can't interfere with that. Damn these human complications, I grumble rubbing my temples. The thought of choosing another woman makes my stomach sour. I tried it this morning. Megan with her overbearing perfume and suggestive smile, Holly with her incessant giggles that grate on my nerves, even sweet-tempered Alice, who wanted nothing more than a friendly chat about the local flora. But no matter who I was with, my mind kept wandering back to Balin. There's only one woman I want. And she belongs to another man. She needs to go back home, I mutter to myself. She needs to be with her baby's father. That's how it should be. But as I picture it, my heart aches, a lump forms in my throat, and all I can think is how terribly wrong it all feels. My bear growls in protest. It's not the way things should be. But it's the way things have to be. For her. For the kid. And if it tears me apart in the process? Well, that's a price I'm willing to pay. Love and family. That's what it's all about, Zandros. My father's words echo in my head. I know Balin must have a mate somewhere. A baby daddy, as the humans call it. I've seen it happen. Human men disappear at the first hint of responsibility, only to come crawling back when they realize what they've lost. She's the one. My bear says. Damn it bear, I mutter under my breath springing to my feet. Get it together. With a sigh, I wander off into the pines before another woman who isn't Balin can corner me. I lean against the rough bark of a tree, folding my arms. The smell of pine helps to clear my head, but it's a losing battle. My mind is stuck on a loop. Balin, her unborn child. And her missing mate. Humans, I grumble, scrubbing a hand over my face. They split up over anything. Cold coffee. Snoring. Toilet seats. The idea of it makes my blood boil. The thought of Balin returning home to LA stings like a thorn in my paw. But it's for the best, right? I can't play homewrecker, no matter how messed up the original home might be. I've got principles. Sheesh Sandros, I sigh shaking my head. You really stepped in a pile of shit this time. My stomach churns at the thought of courting another woman, but Balin and her child deserve a complete family. 
If that means I have to step aside and watch her find her happiness with another man, so be it. As long as she's happy. Man who knew this BFB program would prove to be such a pain in the ass. I don't know what's happening to me. I can't stop thinking of her. Silas laments when we meet up in the woods later for our nightly shift. He seems to be as head over heels for Kate as I am for Balin. Maybe she's your fated mate, I suggest. Like Balin is mine. Laughter erupts from the others, who all start making teasing jibes about fated mates as though I suggested the earth was flat. I get it. We all grew up with rumors of fated mates, but in a clan where the men outnumber the women by eight to one, most of us assumed the concept of fated mates was just a myth. To be fair, not a lot of elderly shifters believed in fated mates either. I suppose that's because they never found theirs. My dad used to say, Tandros, when you find your fated mate, you'll know instantly she's the one. Your other half. Well, I found her all right. None of those stories about fated mates ever gave any advice about what to do when your fated mate already belongs to another man. Chapter 7 I try my best to look perky but it smells like Satan's gym socks around here. I wish I could breathe in the cool evening air at tonight's movie night under the stars, but every inhale takes my stomach on a roller coaster ride. Why did I ever volunteer to serve popcorn? Alice, my helper tonight, glances my way every few minutes, her brows furrowed as if she's worried about me. She catches my not-so-subtle grimace as I serve up another batch. You all right, Bilin? Her tone is casual, but her eyes squint in scrutiny. Yeah, just a bit tired. Lie. I'm gonna puke my guts up. I grimace again as a new wave of nausea washes over me. Why don't you head back to your cabin? Alice suggests, her voice gentle and nurturing. I can handle this myself. I want to argue, to say that I'm okay, but my traitorous stomach roils in agreement with her. Are you sure? She nods, scooping popcorn into a bowl for the next person in line. Positive. Go. Relief floods me and my feet are already moving when I call my thanks to her. Making my way through the trees to our cluster of cabins, my hand rests lightly on my belly. The nausea subsides completely before I reach my cabin, and as I push inside, I wonder if maybe I should head back to the movie. Just as I am about to close the door behind me, a low voice sends a shiver down my spine. You okay? I turn to see Zandro's eyes burning, standing with his arms crossed over his chest. I am now, I answer, surprised by the steadiness in my voice. He looks ready to devour me, and why does that make my salivary glands kick into overdrive? He watches me as though he's waiting for, I don't know, something. His eyes lock on me with such intensity, my heart flutters and my stomach clenches, this time with a needy anticipation. His dark hair is mussed like he's been running his fingers through it, and the corner of his mouth is turned up in a devilish half-smile. My cheeks are on fire. My chest is heaving. He truly is an Adonis. A gorgeous specimen of male magnificence. Do you work out? You must because you are sculpted magnificence. Shut up, Balin. Stop babbling like an idiot. His eyes are glowing like a nightlight. Odd but whatever, even that's sexy. I shouldn't do this. I should put a stop to it right now. He's rude and a fat shamer. Then I remember him saying, You're perfect. Your figure is absolutely perfect, Balin. Okay, maybe he's not a fat shamer. Finally, I raise an eyebrow at him. Are you coming in? I ask. My pulse racing. He doesn't say a word, just bounds up the stairs and grips my waist in his large hands. The moment he touches me, as soon as he makes contact, a sizzle zings through my body straight to my girly bits. He lets out a groan. When he drags me against the hard planes of his body, a searing heat races through me. My palms play on his chest. It's hard as a rock and the sizzle zings straight up my arms. It's as though the universe is trying to tell me something. This is probably a bad idea, a very bad idea, but lord help me, I can't stop. The pregnancy hormones are making me a total hussy. The way he touches me, holds me with such confidence makes me want to hand over total control to him. It's been so long since I felt good. Even with Darren. Don't go there Balin don't think about that asshole. Xandros drags his hand up my stomach, drawing the hem of my tank top along with it. His fingertips brush my bare skin as he slides it up my torso. A quiver of anticipation shoots through me. No man has ever touched me like he does with such reverence. 
This is what I've been missing. This respect, this admiration. He touches me as though I'm something to be cherished, and tears momentarily form in my eyes. A shaky breath leaves my lungs when his mouth captures mine. His tongue pushes past my lips, and he tastes like warm cozy nights in front of a fireplace and a hint of spearmint. My hands slide up his chest and wrap around his neck. The moment I laid eyes on this man, I wanted him. All of the men in the program are gorgeous, but there's something extra special about Xandros. Something that draws me to him, like an invisible lasso. He's an escape from the bad memories, is all. But I don't think that is true, not completely. With each stroke of his tongue, I fall a little harder. My tongue tangles with his, and a rumbly growl comes from somewhere deep in his chest. The sound sends a surge of moisture to my core. His erection grinds into my belly and, oh my. His kiss is wild, passionate, and untamed. Each time he changes the angle of his head, a moan escapes my lips. Then, without warning and without breaking our kiss, he scoops me into his arms and carries me across the room to the bed. He must not need to use his eyes because even in the darkened room, he doesn't trip, he doesn't stumble. He lays me carefully on the bed like I'm made of glass. I kind of assume he's going to continue treating me with kid gloves, so I'm surprised when he grabs the waistband of my shorts and panties and in one none too gentle move yanks them down my legs and tosses them across the room. He's on me in seconds. As he lies next to me, fully clothed, his big thick erection digs into my thigh and his hands are everywhere. Oh, he likes to take charge. I don't hate that. I don't hate that at all. He's mine. What? Where'd that thought come from? He trails kisses over my jawbone and clamps his teeth onto my sensitive earlobe. He smells like the outdoors. Like the pine forest dotted mountains and something wild and animalistic. He kisses down my neck and collarbone and his mouth latches onto my breast, sucking hard. Oh, yes. As he laves my other nipple, his fingers swipe over my drenched folds and I rock my hips to meet him. Nice and wet. He whispers as he pushes a finger into me. That's my good girl. My back arches off the mattress when he slides his body down and tongues my clit while his finger works its way slowly in and out of me. Holy mother of, he knows how to play my body like a symphony. I'm on fire. He adds a second finger and each stroke in and out seems to hit all the right nerve endings. His beard scratches the soft skin of my thighs as he eats me but I love it. I'm lost. I'm completely lost to this man. My hands thread through his hair and I buck against his mouth moaning to the rhythm he sets. His tongue swirls my clit and his fingers work me harder faster as I rock my hips to meet his thrusts. I'm on the verge of coming. Right on the edge. That's my girl. Come for me. And I do. I come so hard I see stars. The room spins and I think I'm screaming. I hear his gruff voice say, Fuck you're beautiful. My pulse thunders in my ear as the waves of my orgasm crash over me. It seems to last for ages. I've never come so hard in my entire life. As I float down from my euphoria, my eyes remain closed and my lungs struggle for breath. Then I hear the door click. Shakily, I rise up on my elbows and look around. I don't see Xandros. The room is empty. What just happened? Chapter 8 Mama's Den Diner is buzzing with the chatter of bride and groom candidates as the smell of fresh bacon eggs and pancakes fills the air. The place is all wood and country charm with an endless supply of coffee that's a little too bitter for my taste. Not that I'm complaining, I need all the alertness I can get this morning. On the other side of the room, Balin sits at a table, avoiding my gaze with a vengeance, but hell if she doesn't look beautiful while doing it. Angry Balin is beautiful. Sulking Balin is beautiful. Balin is beautiful, full stop. A sense of guilt gnaws at me. I regret last night. She deserved better. I should have kept my hands off her. You shouldn't have bailed on her, Casanova, my bear pipes up. Every time I glance her way, my mind is flooded with memories. Her hair splayed out on the pillow, lips parted in sweet surrender as my hands explore the silken expanse of her skin. Her body arched beneath mine, her small hands fisting in my hair as she loses herself to pleasure. The sound of her gasps in my ear, the taste of her sweet pussy and the way she cries out my name, I can still hear it echoing in my ears. On the other side of the room, Hernan has a woman clinging to him like a barnacle on a ship's hull, and he doesn't look thrilled about it. His eyes keep straying to Louise, the new owner of Mama's Den, as she hustles about serving coffee and pancakes. Waylon is in the corner sitting alone, 
his usual jovial demeanor replaced by a deep scowl. His intense gaze is set on the table Balin is sitting at, but his attention is clearly not on my Balin, so I'll let him live. Balin, meanwhile, isn't looking at any of the men. For that, I'm grateful. But she's also not looking at me. She chats with Kate and a few others. She's trying to act like nothing happened between us, but when her eyes meet mine, I see not only fury but also embarrassment, and I'm struck with another pang of guilt. After breakfast, we all head out for the hike. I trail Balin like some love-struck teenager stalking his crush down the school hallway to her locker. Although it's a touch more complicated than that, seeing as she's carrying another man's baby. I try to stay inconspicuous since she hates me and all, but I keep my senses tuned to her every gesture, every twitch of her lips, every crease of her brow, every half-hidden smile, every flicker of sadness that passes over her features. I can't barge into her life the way I want. I won't disrupt what the future may hold for her, no matter how much my bear and I yearn to claim her as ours. I want to step up, I do. I want to stake my claim over her, but the thought of potentially destroying a family binds my feet more effectively than a steel-jawed bear trap. Even if I can't claim her, even if I can't have her the way I want, I can at least make sure she's safe, right? She and the baby, they feel like mine. I know that sounds messed up but on this point, my bear and I are finally in agreement on something. My blood turns cold as my thoughts suddenly take a darker turn. What if this baby daddy isn't Mr. Nice Guy? I've heard tales of human men who mistreat their women. Shifters don't have a concept of domestic violence. We treat our mates like queens because that's what they are to us, and with our shortage of females, those who are blessed with a wife, a mate, are just that, blessed. But humans, they can be different altogether. The mere thought of Balin in such a predicament makes my inner bear snarl. Perhaps I should have asked her about her situation. Perhaps you should have claimed her as ours. Shut the fuck up, bear. As the group moves ahead, the gap between Balin and the rest of the hikers grows. Subtly, I adjust my pace to match hers, still maneuvering to stay out of her line of sight. I keep my gaze fixed on her, monitoring her every move. There's a listlessness to her movements, a weariness that seems to permeate her very bones. Stomach churning I watch as Balin slows even further, dropping farther behind the group. With each step she's shrinking in on herself, her strength fading, and my heart lurches. When the terrain levels out and Balin stumbles, a tiny squeak escapes her lips. And there it is, the trigger that unleashes the floodgates of my protective instincts. I dart from my hiding spot, but a prickling sensation stops me dead in my tracks. Wait. She's already upset with me, and hell I can't blame her. Before I can wrestle my conflicting urges, to keep my distance or to come forward and offer her an arm to hold onto, she turns around, her gaze meeting mine with a sharp, furious intensity. She's pissed. What the hell, Zandros? She points an accusatory finger my way. Are you following me? I flash her a grin. Um, just honing my ninja skills. I can't take my eyes off her. My bear is demanding, roaring and gnashing its teeth for me to take her in my arms. Enough with the jokes. Balin's voice wobbles, just a touch, but enough to have my heart pounding louder than a jackhammer. My focus is dialed into Balin so intently, I can count each beat of her pulse. A low growl rumbles in my chest as she opens her mouth to say something else, but her words die as her face goes pale. Her breath emerges shallow and rapid. A wave of panic crashes over me. I bolt toward her, my heart pounding in sync with the frantic rhythm of my boots against the earth. Her eyelashes flutter and I skid to a stop, catching her in my arms just as her knees buckle and her eyes roll back in her head. Chapter 9 It feels like 50-pound weights are attached to my eyelashes. Why in the world do I feel like I've just gone a few rounds with a cement truck? I can hear voices, a deep baritone that sounds like Xandro's and another voice from a woman I don't recognize. Hers is high-pitched, with an almost chipper tone that wouldn't sound out of place at a church picnic. I told you, Zandros, my specialty is bear shifter births. I'm not used to dealing with human pregnancies. Bear shifter births? What? Am I on a sci-fi movie set? The closest human hospital is two hours away. I can practically hear Zandros's worry radiating off him. Something wrenches in my chest. She's not going to. Die, right? Die. Heavens no. Don't worry. The woman laughs. She sounds a touch too familiar with Zandros for my liking. Her vitals are good. She just had too much sun. 
Humans are so fragile. Did she just call me fragile? Wait, humans. That's it. Enough eavesdropping. I struggle to sit up, but it feels like my body is made of lead, so I just crack my eyelids instead and squint at the unfamiliar woman hunched over me. She's wearing blue scrubs with a quirky pin that says shift happens, and a badge clipped to her shirt that reads, Dr. Miriam. Hey there. Dr. Miriam greets me with a friendly wink. She sounds way too chipper for someone who has just been arguing about my potentially life-threatening condition. Hey. I give her a crooked smile. How are you feeling? Well doc, right now I'm feeling like the little metal ball in a pinball machine. Peachy. She smiles and nods. Meanwhile, Xandros lingers in the doorway. I see relief wash over his face but it's quickly replaced by a stoic expression. Well, aren't we the master of emotional hide-and-seek? I narrow my eyes at Dr. Miriam. Did you say something about bears? Dr. Miriam's eyes widen. No, no, I don't think so. You must be confused. She pats my arm. You'll be fine though. Just a touch too much exertion in the hot sun. Sure, Doc, sure. Anyway. She drops her gaze to the medical bag she has clutched in her hand. You should rest, drink plenty of fluids, and supplement with electrolytes. The pregnancy looks good. Just stay off your feet for the next 24 hours, okay? After that, you can resume normal activities. Yeah, I mumble. Thank you, Miriam. Xandros walks the doctor to the door. Well, the cat's out of the bag now. As soon as the door clicks shut, I turn my face into the pillow, a flood of embarrassment washing over me. Xandros knows I lied. His dark eyes fill with something I can't quite place. How are you feeling? His voice is soft and caring. It's almost like he's genuinely worried about me. Is that possible? After I lied to him. I've had better days, I quip, trying to lighten the mood. Maybe I should apologize for lying to him. But really is it any of his business? Of course it's his business, Balin. You were planning to marry him and pawn off someone else's kid as his. You should be ashamed of yourself. Sorry, I mumble. He looks taken aback. For what? Oh, where do I start? I lied. How did you figure it out, though? His only response is silence, which, to be honest, is not as comforting as one would hope. I summon the strength to attempt to swing my legs off the side of the bed and sit up. What the hell do you think you're doing? Xandros's expression is thunderous. I shoot him a quizzical look. Do I need to spell it out? Having failed the first time, I make a second attempt to hoist myself up. I'm trying to get up. Oh no you're not. He practically growls as he plants his hands firmly on his hips. The doctor said to stay off your feet for 24 hours. For a moment, I'm stunned silent by his unexpected outburst. Then I'm annoyed. The nerve of this guy. Yet my irritation is soon tinged with a strange relief. It's been a while since anyone's shown concern for me and it's surprisingly comforting. But comfort or not, I've got my pride. And his disappearing act last night, while I was still naked and spread eagle on this very bed, put a big dent in it. Well, aren't you a regular Prince Charming? I snap. But last I checked, this is my cabin. You don't get to decide what I do here. His eyebrows shoot up, clearly not expecting my fiery response. With a grunt, I start to swing my legs off the side of the bed again, only to find a wall of Greek god-like physique blocking my path. Oh no you don't. Xandros's deep voice booms through the cabin, and I fall back onto my pillows. You're not the boss of me. Mature Balin, real mature, what are you, Seven? He lets out a grunt of frustration. Why are you even here, Xandros? I snap, my defenses bristling despite the odd flutter in my heart at his concern. You don't need to play the knight in shining armor. A memory rushes into my head of me yelling at him out on the ridge, then of him lunging forward to catch me before everything went black. Way to go, Balin, he did play knight in shining armor for you today. His eyes narrow at my tone and I deflate a bit. I'm not usually this rude. Maybe it's the pregnancy hormones. That, or the fact that last night he ate your pussy like a starving man one minute and ran like you were contagious the next. Xandros looks uncharacteristically contrite. Suddenly I can't stand this push-pull between us. I'm tired. I need a nap. I appreciate the concern, but there's no need for you to stick around. 
There's a beat of silence, and for a moment, I think he's going to ignore me and sit in the chair beside my bed. Let me rephrase that, I say. Get the hell out. He looks as though he's going to argue. Instead he nods stiffly, turns toward the door, and leaves me alone with my whirling thoughts and my acid tongue. Chapter 10 There was a report of another wolf sighting near town again today, I informed Silas and the other officers. We're gathered in our Alpha's office to discuss our recent wolf shifter dilemma. I don't know what the fuck is with these wolves infringing on our territory, but with the BFB program in full swing, the timing couldn't be worse. We may not be at war with the neighboring wolf pack, but our clan and theirs have been rivals for generations. The peace is kept by sticking to our own territories. This breach could be considered an act of war, although I doubt any of us are keen to retaliate rashly. Silas rubs his forehead. We can't take any chances, especially not with human females in town. True, they're vulnerable. Lake agrees. We have to protect the females. We agree to stay alert for any suspicious activity, and as the others vacate our Alpha's office, I linger. You got something on your mind, Xandros? Silas inquires. I shrug, play with a paperweight, and sit in the chair opposite his desk. I was going to ask you the same question. He sighs heavily and hands me a parchment, the preferred mode of communication by the Shifter Council. Oh, not good. The Shifter Council has given Silas two days to find a mate. I look up to catch my Alpha's gaze. Well, there are a lot of impressive candidates to consider. He shakes his head vehemently. Only one matters. I understand. Boy do I understand. Kate is my choice. Silas slams his fist on the desk. My heart chooses her. My bear chooses her. I choose her. He looks me in the eyes. You know we used to believe the elders were joking about fated mates. We thought it was nonsense. But I'm certain, Kate is my fated mate. And I'm certain Balin is mine. Standing, I grip his shoulder. My suggestion? Fight for her. If she's truly your fated mate, fight brother. As my words hang in the air, I wonder if I'm taking my own advice. I want to. I want to fight for Balin, but does fighting for Balin mean continuing to stay away from her like I thought, or should I start fighting to be with her? Tucked behind the bushes, I keep a watchful eye on Balin's cabin. Two days and nights. That's how long I've been stationed outside here, shrouded in the embrace of the woods keeping watch like a sentinel. My nostrils flare as I catch a whiff of dinner in the air. Ah, Louise. Right on time. The porch light flickers on and I see Louise, the sassy new owner of Mama's Den Diner, making her way up the front steps of Balin's cabin. With the grace of a ballerina, Lou balances a covered plate in one hand and a jug in the other. Even from this distance I can smell it and my stomach growls in response. Louise disappears inside for a few minutes and then heads back down the porch stairs. I'm not surprised when she veers off the path and walks straight toward me. I lean back into the shadowy bushes, hoping to blend in with the foliage. No such luck. Xandros. Lou crosses her arms and taps her foot impatiently like she's scolding a wayward child. You've been sitting out here like a kicked puppy for two days. Who's kicked? I retort, trying to sound nonchalant. I'm just... Bird watching. She huffs, not buying my lie. Aha. Uh -huh. Pull the other one. How was the delivery? I stand and dust myself off, then dig in my pocket to offer her some crumpled bills. She swats my hand away and eyes me up and down. I gave her the grilled salmon you cooked and the lemon ginger tea you prepared for her. It should help with nausea. You didn't tell her it was from me, did you? I grumble, stashing the money back in my pocket. No. But you should. I'll never understand how Lou is able to look down her nose at me when I'm almost a foot and a half taller than her. Should what? You should tell her. About this. She waves her hand around at the woods, and I know what she's getting at. Talk to her. You're clearly head over heels for the woman. I swallow the lump in my throat, the memory of her telling me to get the hell out still fresh. She doesn't want to see me. Then start with an apology. Beg if you have to. And for heaven's sake Xandros tell her about shifters. Louise's eyes soften. The woman's got it bad for you too. 
but hiding out in the woods watching her cabin night and day like some creepy stalker is not going to get you anywhere. Not to mention cooking her meals and having me deliver them as though they're from the diner. Although I don't mind claiming them. That venison stew you made the other day. She does a chef's kiss, then wags a finger at me. I want the recipe. She kicked me out, Lou. Lou's gaze softens. Communication, Zandros. It's huge in a relationship. Maybe start there. Communication. Louise has a point. Maybe it's time for Balin and me to lay all our cards on the table. The council forbade us to reveal our shifter side, but desperate times call for desperate measures, right? I give Louise a nod and she huffs and gives me one of her signature disgusted looks. Get your head out of your ass is all I'm saying. Then she marches off, leaving me alone with my thoughts. Maybe Lou is right. Maybe it's time to stop watching from the sidelines, or in my case the bushes. Chapter 11 Tonight's formal ball should be in full swing by now. Xandros is probably there, surrounded by women draped over him and drooling on him, which is why I opted to skip it. I don't need to see that. Instead, I'm perched on the edge of my bed in my cabin, nibbling on one of Louise's carrot cake muffins. They're delicious. I cast a glance at my belly, draped in the soft fabric of my nightgown. Sorry little bun. I lay a hand gently on my tiny bump. Mommy's still trying to get her act together. It may take a bit more time. Truth is, Mommy is failing miserably. Just as I'm about to launch into a round of self-berating, there's a knock at my door and I startle. Could it be Zandros? No, of course not. Don't be ridiculous. I swing open the door to reveal Kate, the BFB coordinator. She doesn't look so good. Her face is pale, her eyes are slightly red-rimmed, and her hands have a faint tremble. Hi Kate. Aren't you supposed to be at the formal ball? Yes well. Kate huffs out a breath. I left. She doesn't offer any more of an explanation, so I don't ask. Then Kate's expression becomes apologetic. Sorry for barging in on you like this but I need a place to hang out. I'm headed back to the city but my taxi won't be here for a few hours yet. Do you mind some company? I wave her in, the prospect of company suddenly appealing. I have another favor to ask. Kate settles herself on the couch. Her voice is hesitant. I've been, um, called away and I was hoping you'd be able to oversee the remaining BFB activities. I blink at her. As in, you want me to take charge? Everything's organized to a T right down to the last detail, I promise. Well, I say after a long pause. Let's see what you've got planned. She hands me a folder, which I open to find meticulously laid out plans for the rest of the activities. Kate springs up and begins walking around the cabin as I scan the folder's contents. Easy peasy. Hey, if I can handle all the crap Darren threw at me, I can handle overseeing a few more pre-planned events. Kate's practically vibrating with tension as she paces my cabin's tiny floor space, and there's a worried look in her eyes. Kate, I don't mean to pry, but what are you running away from? I blurt out before I can stop myself. Kate freezes and then laughs nervously, shaking her head. Not running exactly. More like recalibrating. Oh, recalibrating. As though that's not a fancy word for running like hell. I ought to know. Kate grins at me, then sobers. I just need a bit of city noise to clear my head, you know? Oh do I ever. I think of the concrete jungle I left behind. The one I can never return to. Kate gives me a sympathetic look. I guess misery loves company. Just as we're bonding over our newly discovered common ground, there's a thunderous banging coming from Kate's cabin. We exchange glances. And oh god, a male voice is shouting Kate's name. I'm pretty sure it's Silas. The desperate shout echoes through the quiet night, rattling my bones. Kate's face turns white, then crimson, then settles on a mortified pink. I can't go out there, she whispers. She starts to say something else when Silas's voice booms again. It's a gut punch, hearing the raw pain in his voice. I feel a sharp stab of sympathy for him and it seems Kate does too, if the tortured look on her face is any indication. I need to go back to the city to clear my head, Kate says again, more firmly this time. I nod in understanding, though my mind is whirling. It seems that we both have man problems. As I listen to Silas's anguished cries, I can't help but think of myself, 
hiding away in this cabin while the man I pine for it is probably having a great time dancing with who knows how many other women at the ball. Kate, I start brow furrowing, but the pained expression playing on her features stops me from saying more. She shakes her head and something flickers in her eyes, like maybe she has some secret she isn't sharing. But then, we all have our secrets, don't we? I nod in understanding, before glancing at my slightly swollen belly. I lied to Kate too. The BFB program would have rejected me, had they known I was already pregnant. I get a weird sensation of waking up and having no idea where I am, who I am, or how long I've been out. For a second, I wonder if I'm late for the school bus to Roosevelt Elementary. I blink my eyes open to the rays of early morning sunshine that filter through my window. It's morning? I must have dozed off. Looking around, first I notice the chair next to my bed isn't empty. Next, I notice it's not Kate who's occupying it. Sitting in it like some oversized guard dog is Andros. I should be livid. I mean there he is all handsome and broody in my cabin invading my privacy but for some reason I'm just not. It might have something to do with the torment in Kate's eyes last night or the utter despair in Silas's voice as he called for her. Enjoy the ball. I ask, trying to sound casual. Sweep many women off their feet. He snorts, a half-smile tugging at his lips. There you go with the jealousy again. I scowl at him but he's got a point. Damn it. I didn't go. He meets my gaze with those damn glowing eyes of his. Oh. You didn't. No. I see. My mind whirls trying to process that. Why exactly are you in my cabin at the crack of dawn? I want to talk Balin. His voice holds a note of earnestness as he leans back in his chair, muscles straining his t-shirt and crosses his arms. I think we need some honest communication, you know? Honest communication. I huff yawn and rub the sleep from my eyes. Fine. You start. He nods, seemingly satisfied with that answer. All right. First, how are you feeling? I shrug. Great. Good. He says, his voice a low rumble. Because you're gonna have to come outside for this, and it might be a little shocking, to say the least. Chapter 12 the forest around Balin's cabin is bathed in the soft enchanting glow of dawn's first light. As I glance over at her, I'm as nervous as a pimply teenage boy on his first date. This is big. This is massive. My bear isn't worried at all. He can't wait to prance around and show off in front of our mate. I'm the one riddled with anxiety and dread. You're feeling okay? I asked her that five minutes ago, but I need something to fill this increasingly awkward silence. She gives me a funny look. You just asked me that, Xandros. I'm fine. Now what's this earth-shattering secret you've been sitting on? Right. The secret. My palms are sweaty, and the consequences of what I'm about to do weigh heavily. The Shifter Council could have my hide for breaking their code but she's my mate. She has a right to know everything. I breathe in deeply, then let it out. Balin, I'm not entirely human. Not exactly. That certainly gets her attention. The look in her eyes is one of surprise, disbelief, a little curiosity, and a lot of skepticism. What exactly are you then? I'm a shapeshifter. Specifically, a bear shifter. Her gaze on me is intense, evaluating, and there's a spark in her eyes that wasn't there a minute ago. I like that spark. It gives me hope. Do you believe me? I barely dare to breathe. You don't look as shocked as I expected you to. She contemplates for a moment. Actually, it makes sense. I overheard you talking with Dr. Miriam, and I've been tossing around what you two said in my mind. Wait, is it just you? Is Dr. Miriam a bear shifter too? Almost everyone in Mystic Hollow is a bear shifter, I clarify, a half smile tugging at the corners of my mouth. I thought she'd run for the hills. Instead she stands her ground, arms crossed as she tilts her head, her brows knit together in thought. Balin, I use the pads of my fingers to trace her cheekbone, the action grounding me. Steadying me. Her skin is warm and flushed from excitement, and her eyes are bright. There's something else I need to tell you. It may shock you. She cocks her head to one side. Something more shocking than you being a bear. Her voice is playful and light, and it loosens the knot in my chest. Um yeah. 
Well, maybe. A snort of laughter escapes before I can help it. Ah, uh, shifters have mates. Significant others. Spouses. And when a shifter claims their mate, we have this thing called a claiming mark. Claiming mark. She narrows her eyes. I can almost see the wheels turning in her head. How does that work? Ah,、uh, well, I start scratching at the back of my neck. The claiming mark is something shifters give their mates, with their teeth. This probably sounds like something from a horror movie to her. It's like a, a binding contract, if you will. Hey, she said she worked as a paralegal at a firm specializing in contract law. Her lips part slightly. It's a bite. The silence that follows is deafening. I can hear my heart pounding in my ears as I wait for her reaction, for any indication that she isn't thinking about booking a one-way ticket out of here. She chews her lower lip, a sign I've come to recognize as her mulling things over. Then she nods more to herself than to me. And it signifies you're like what? Married? She asks, her voice barely above a whisper. That's right, I confirm. Only more. Shifters don't divorce. A claiming mark is for life. The question of whether she's ready for that hangs between us. I'll wait for her to bring it up to ask. I won't push it on her. If there's one thing I've learned about Balin, it's that she's worth the wait, and I'll wait a lifetime if I have to. Her brow furrows deeper. Her lips purse as she considers my words. Claiming mark. Sounds a little medieval. I chuckle at that. Yeah, it does sound a bit possessive, doesn't it? It's a promise. It's a, a bond, an affirmation of sorts, a mark that symbolizes a connection. I can see the question swirling in her eyes. When is it given? She's looking at me now, her gaze steady, unblinking. It's her courage that emboldens me. It happens when, when we're, ah,、uh, close. Close. She echoes, a hint of pink spreading across her cheeks. Really close. Like, ah,、uh, well, when we're making love. And there it is, out in the open. She's quiet, processing. Her gaze flicking between my eyes, I can almost see her weighing, deciding. She seems to have accepted everything I've told her so far with ease. So you're not going to run screaming into your cabin and lock the door. A pesky lock wouldn't keep me out, but she doesn't know that. Nope. But I might need more convincing. She raises an eyebrow in challenge. Well, at least she didn't faint again. Yet. There's no time to waste. I strip my clothes off, tossing them into a pile on the forest floor. As I strip, I tell her about shifter loyalty, our protectiveness, our devotion. I talk us up as a species the best I can, and then I do it. I shift. My body warps, expands, and reshapes. My senses heighten. In seconds, I'm a full-grown grizzly, towering over her as she stares in awestruck silence. I'd be lying if I said the moment after the shift. Isn't one of the most nerve-wracking I've ever experienced. Here I am, fully in my fur, a 700-pound grizzly staring into Balin's eyes, prepared for shock, fear, possibly a fainting spell. Who knows? What I'm not prepared for is laughter. Her eyes are practically twinkling, and her mouth is pulled into a huge grin. She throws back her head and laughs, a full-throated, joyful sound that fills the clearing. This was not what I was expecting. Then to top it all off, she runs to me and, before I know it, throws her arms around my huge neck. Her fingers thread through my thick fur. I'm so shocked I can only stand there as she buries her face in my fur and murmurs something about how fluffy I am. You're so soft. Her touch is bold, pure and blissful, without hesitation, without reservation. I realize with a heady surge of delight that she's not only accepting my bear, she's thrilled by me. So I do what any good grizzly would do. I roll on my back, inviting her to give belly scratches, which she does while still giggling. I toss gentle, playful swipes of my paw at her, watching her squeal in excitement and duck away, only to come running back for more. Seeing her so carefree, the tension that's been there since I first met her melting away—it makes my heart swell in a way I've never felt before. She's not afraid, not in the least. Every growl and swipe from me only seems to entertain her more. Her laughter is infectious, and I find myself romping around with her in the woods. A wildness in our play that feels as rudimentary as the earth beneath my paws. She adores my bear. She embraces my secret, but I have yet to learn hers.
Chapter 13 There's a strange pulsing quiet in the room. If I thought seeing a man turn into a grizzly bear was stunning, seeing that same bear morph back into the muscled naked god of a man was utterly breathtaking. Of course he's not still naked. He sprawled on my small sofa in the cabin, all taut muscles and hulking physique, radiating a natural raw power that sends a shiver of sheer lust through me. His probing eyes meet mine and I take a deep breath pulling myself together. It's time for me to spill my truth. I tuck a loose strand of hair behind my ear, glancing at him, and then down at my barely there bump. I guess now it's my turn. I swallow down the lump in my throat. My baby sperm donor. His name is Darren Douglas. Zandros's face is unreadable. The name doesn't mean anything to him, of course it wouldn't. He's a lawyer, I add, as if that will make a difference. The room feels like it's closing in on me. A high-powered attorney in L.A. A very big deal. A powerful man. I squeeze my hands together, anxiety gnawing at me. Darren. Zandros repeats the name slowly, tasting it as though it's a sour lemon. And where is Darren now? Probably with his wife. I laugh, but it comes out more like a bitter snort. Or maybe he has a new mistress. Nice, Balin, way to go. Just spit it right out, no need to sugarcoat. There. I've dropped the bomb. And boy, does it land like a deafening silence after a bad joke at a party. I take a deep breath, ready to face the fallout. Zandros's face remains stoic, unreadable. Not exactly the reaction I was expecting, but then again, I've learned not to expect anything normal around Zandros. Don't judge. It's not as though I'd willingly get involved with a married man. I didn't know. I blow out a hard breath and rub my forehead. I'm not sure what that makes me, stupid. Naive. Foolish. All of the above. But in my defense, he didn't wear a wedding ring, he had no pictures of her in the office, no one at the firm ever mentioned her, and I was new on the job. And you're babbling again, Balin. Get on with it. Anyway, Darren came on strong. He whined and dined me, he made me feel like, well, that doesn't matter. Darren would love nothing more than for little Bun and me to disappear off the face of the earth. The words tumble out much harsher than I intend. I swallow audibly and seat myself gingerly on the sofa next to Zandro's. When I told Darren I was pregnant, he went ballistic. That's when I found out he was married. I pause, letting the words hang in the air. He was so angry. So cruel. I'd never seen him like that before. He made threats. He told me, he was going to ruin my life if I didn't abort the baby. He spread rumors about me and I. I lost my job. Not only that, but he blackballed me from every firm within his reach, which I learned is pretty much all of them in LA. He even had me evicted from my apartment, I suppose just to let me know how powerful he is in the city. How do you manage that? Zandros's brow is furrowed and a muscle in his jaw ticks. He had the building condemned. I have no idea how. I guess he has influence over the city building inspectors. When I say his influence is far-reaching. I take a deep breath watching as Zandros clenches and unclenches his teeth. His eyes, once unreadable, now flash with what I guess to be anger. And I wonder, is that anger aimed at me or Darren or both? I want to keep my baby. So when I heard of BFB and arranged marriages, I shrug, a half-hearted smile pulling at my lips, I thought maybe it was the hand of fate directing me. I thought it would be a perfect escape for me and little Bun. I thought Darren would never be able to touch me here, and I could provide a good life for my baby. I look up at Zandros then, really look at him, and he's just watching me quietly, his face still hard. I. I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I plan to find a husband quickly, and never tell my husband the baby wasn't his. My voice is a whisper now. I'm sorry. For trying to trick you. I feel the words squeeze my heart, my gaze flicking up to meet his, only to find him shaking his head. I was just trying to give little Bun a life where he or she would be provided for, cared for and loved. I'm so sorry Zandros. No. He holds up a hand, his voice as firm and solid as bedrock. Don't apologize. That throws me for a loop. I blink at him. Tears fill my eyes. But I. No buts. He interrupts gently. You have nothing to apologize for. You were dealt a terrible hand, and you did what you had to do. There's no shame in survival. Plus you were right on all counts. 
The hand of fate did guide you here, and you and the... Ah. Uh, little bun. A hint of a smile crosses his face. Will be provided for, cared for, and loved. By me. If you'll have me. His words echo in the small cabin, my heart pounding so loud in my ears I can barely hear anything else. And just like that, the raging storm in my heart subsides. His words wrap around me with warm comfort, and I can't help but smile at this man bear who's stolen my heart. Yes. Yes, all. We'll have you. A hot flush hits my face as I take a deep breath. You really mean it, right? The corners of Zandra's mouth turn upward in an irresistible grin. His eyes dance with an intoxicating mix of passion and reverence that simultaneously sets my heart racing and puts my nerves at ease. Every single word, Balin. My heart throbs in my chest threatening to burst from pure joy. About that claiming mark thing you mentioned earlier. I look up at him through my lashes, suddenly aware of the seriousness of my words. Did you mean what you said? About wanting to. I mean do you want to? I trail off, suddenly finding it hard to meet his eyes. His grin widens into a full-fledged beaming smile. He moves closer, gently nudging my chin upward, encouraging me to look at him. I would be honored if you would wear my claiming mark. Xandra's expression transforms into a look of pure heated desire. He closes the gap between us and in the blink of an eye, his lips are on mine. It's as though all the love, all the longing, all the desire and hope we've shared finally combusts, lighting a fiery trail that travels straight to my core. Chapter 14 Xandros kisses me fiercely. His mouth is bruising and his kiss leaves no doubt about what he wants from me. His lips, his tongue, they're possessive and claiming. His kiss is a wildfire and we both emerge gasping for air. Just when I feel I might melt into jelly, he lifts me effortlessly and carries me to the small table in the center of the room. His hands cut my ass. His body is a wall of hardened muscle. The raw primal side of Xandros roars to life. Dropping me to my feet, he yanks my nightgown over my head in one swift motion, and his mouth descends to my neck and chest, kissing and nipping my skin until I squirm against him. He teases my nipples with his teeth and tongue. I'm floating, consumed by desire for him. All thought is lost, replaced by the overwhelming need for his touch. My nails scrape down his arms as he teases my nipples. Then he's back at my mouth, kissing me with a feverish intensity. His focus is singular as his hands deftly work my panties down my legs. Then, in a swift movement, he spins me around and bends me over the table. I gasp as his thick cock thrusts into me hard and fast. It's so primitive, so animalistic, so damn good. His hand buries itself in my hair, pulling my head up so his lips can find my neck. Pinned against the polished wood table, I gasp and moan under him. The rough denim of his jeans against my bare thighs, the fullness of his cock in me, the prickle of his beard against my neck as his breath fans my ear, it's a wild rush of sensation, igniting an inferno. You're mine, Balin. Xandros's voice is deep. His animal side must be close to the surface because it sounds more like growling than speaking. Mine. Say it. I gasp as he thrusts into me harder. I'm yours. You belong to me. I belong to you. His tongue traces a spot on my neck. You'll wear my mark. Mine. My head spins as the waves of an impending climax start to build. My body tightens, fingers clutching the edge of the tabletop as I search for something to ground me. There's no one else for you. He curls his hand around my throat and holds me in place. Say there's no one else. There's no one else. I'm yours, Xandros. Yours. I don't even recognize the breathless vixen who's moaning for Xandros. He tightens his hand on my throat for a beat, and then presses a hot kiss under my ear. And you own me, mate. I gasp just as my orgasm crashes over me. My core tightens around him until he growls and goes still. The world starts to blur around the edges, and I feel a pressure on my neck, a pinch followed by a wave of ecstasy that ripples through my body. I gasp as a new sensation, both frightening and exhilarating, overtakes me. Blinding pleasure pulses through me. It goes on and on as I feel Xandros coming with me. The only things that stop me from floating away are his arms wrapped around me. When everything begins to settle and reality starts sneaking in, I replay his last words. Mate. He called me his mate. Xandros slowly separates from me and disappears into the bathroom for a second. Then he's back cleaning me. I'm limp and sated as he lifts me in his arms. My mind slowly gains traction and replays everything he said. 
He holds me against his chest as he carries me to the bed and lays me down. Then he curses under his breath. I'm sorry. Was I too rough? Not at all. I flash him what I'm sure is a megawatt smile. We're mates? He pulls back enough to look at me and nods. We're mates. And I feel it, deep in my bones, a connection stronger than anything I've ever known. It's as though I'm a part of him, and he is a part of me, now and forever. Chapter 15 Mikasa Sukasa, quite literally. Zandros is grinning as he motions around the room with a flourish. Welcome to our humble abode. His house. Correction, our house is so charming it's bordering on cliché. It's like a great big gingerbread house with a spacious open plan layout, a high beamed ceiling and a large stone fireplace. Humble. I laugh, raising a brow as I take in the interior of the house. I'm pretty sure this is not the definition of humble. He chuckles, a warm rumbling sound that sends a pleasant shiver down my spine. Ah semantics. You'll get used to it. Besides it's not a home without you in it. My heart clenches at his words and I roll my eyes to hide the sudden blush on my cheeks. You're just full of cheesy lines today, aren't you? Better get used to him. He offers me a flirtatious wink and a wide handsome grin. From now on, I'm saving them all for you. Xandros nudges me gently and I realize I've been gaping. This is. Then I spot a picture. I walk over and pick up the framed photo of two large grizzly bears and a smaller one in the middle. He chuckles, running a hand through his hair. Yeah, well, family photos can be a bit unconventional when you and both of your parents are bear shifters. I can't help but smile. Speaking of my parents, both of them are rather excited to meet you. Zandros's voice is casual, but I can see the hopeful glint in his eyes. Especially my mother. She's thrilled about having not only a new daughter, but a grandbaby on the way. A rush of anxiety runs through me. She's happy. Are you kidding? His hand reaches out to gently cup my belly. I mean, it's not every day you get to tell your mom she's going to be a mother-in-law and a grandma. Well, you do move fast, don't you? I feel a warm glow spreading through me. It's all so much to process, but I can't deny that the thought of making a home here with Zandros fills me with a deep sense of rightness. He takes my hand, pulls me down a hallway, and flings open a door to reveal a beautiful spacious bedroom filled with soft natural light. I was thinking that this will make the perfect nursery for our baby. My breath catches. Our baby. The word sounds surreal but so right. Tears burn the backs of my eyes. Balin, are you okay? His expression looks worried. Oh yeah. I blink back the moisture. Just daydreaming. What do you think about a forest theme in here? I tease. Sounds good. We can get a giant stuffed bear that looks like a mini-me. Xandros grins, wrapping his arms around my waist from behind as a laugh bubbles up my throat. Our baby might grow up thinking they're Tarzan or Mowgli. We both laugh but truthfully, I love the idea and I think Xandros does too. The room itself is empty, save for a couple of storage boxes, but I can already envision a crib in one corner and a comfy rocking chair by the window. The room is airy and bright, a blank canvas. It's perfect, I breathe out. I take a step into the room and turn to look at him. The happiness in his eyes is so intense it takes my breath away. We can start painting and decorating soon, he says. My stomach chooses that moment to grumble embarrassingly loudly. He chuckles and nuzzles my neck before reluctantly pulling away. But first, I need to cook dinner for my woman and our little bun. Wait a second, I say as he leads me to the kitchen. You cook. I'm half surprised, half delighted. This is an unexpected bonus. He glances over his shoulder as he pulls fresh vegetables from the refrigerator. The kitchen is state-of-the-art and Zandros moves around it like he was born to be here. I watch him chop celery, onions and carrots with a finesse that would put a professional chef to shame. Then he tosses garlic into a pan to simmer. My brows shoot up as I lean on the counter, watching him. Wow. I can't wait to sample your cooking. You already have. His grin is half pride, half mischief. Remember those meals Louise delivered to your cabin? My eyes widen. No way. Yep. He nods. Even the carrot cake muffins? I'd do anything for another one of those. An impish smile plays on his lips. Anything. 
He waggles his brows. Playfully, I smack his chest. Stop teasing. His deep rich laughter fills the room until the sound of his cell interrupts our banter. His brow furrows when he checks the screen and as he answers, tension radiates off of him. A knot forms in my stomach. Whatever is being said on the other end, it's serious. I quietly shuffle towards him, placing a comforting hand on his arm. Thanks, Waylon. When he hangs up, the carefree glow is gone. In its place is an edge of worry, an unsettling intensity. We have a situation, he says. Zandros's fingers immediately start tapping the screen of his phone. I feel my heart drop, every nerve in my body tensing. What's wrong? Who are you calling? I'm calling Silas. One of the women in the program is missing. A muscle in his jaw ticks. And there's the scent of wolf shifter all over the area where she was last seen. My blood runs cold at his words, my mind immediately going to the worst case scenario. Oh my god. Wait, there are wolf shifters too. I want to ask Xandros about wolf shifters, but he's already talking animatedly to Silas as he paces the room. For a moment I feel lost in a world I barely understand, but then I look around at our home. I picture our future nursery and I square my shoulders. This is my world now, it's where little Bun and I belong and I'm ready to face it head on. Epilogue Ten months later So princess, enjoying your party. I laugh as my husband, my mate, still getting used to that word, makes funny faces at the little bundle of joy in his arms. She coos and flails her tiny fists in response. A warm feeling blooms in my chest. He's got this whole proud dad thing going on. Can't say I blame him. Our little one is a heart stealer for sure. We named our daughter Charlotte, but from the day she was born everyone in town has called her princess. Xandros rocks princess in one arm and slips the other arm around my waist pulling me against his side. What do you think the chances are that princess will grow up without being spoiled by this entire town? I ask, leaning into his warm embrace. She's the first baby born in Mystic Hollow in four years, and the first baby girl in forty. I'd say there's zero chance. She's royalty. I have to agree. We're standing in the center of the town square where a huge party is in progress. A parade, decorations, music, dancing, food, the works. It's a royal celebration. Our baby girl is the guest of honor. This is Mystic Hollow's way of rolling out the red carpet for our little princess, and just about every resident is in attendance. Laughter and joy fill the air, a testament to the close-knit shifter community where our daughter will grow up. I snuggle deeper into Zandra's side as our daughter, our little bundle of joy and reason for our infinite sleep deprivation, reaches out with a pudgy hand to smack Zandra's right in the nose. He roars with laughter, and I can't help but burst into giggles myself. Already knows how to put a man in his place. He mumbles something about already having one feisty female to deal with. I just flutter my eyelashes innocently, ignoring the warm squeeze in my heart at his words. The lively revelry of the townsfolk around us is a pleasant backdrop for our private bubble of domestic bliss. Who knows what the future will bring. But right now we have this moment, our baby, our love, and our community. And honestly, it's more than I could ever dream of. Suddenly, a small figure with a mop of unruly hair and a determined expression detaches itself from the crowd. The boy couldn't be older than four or five. He moves toward us. Then he gazes up at Princess and something strange happens. Our daughter turns her head to stare at him and the moment their eyes meet, the little boy's eyes glow. Literally. Xandros and I exchange glances, our smiles fading into something softer, more contemplative. I shake my head in disbelief. Seems like our princess may already have found her prince. We hope you have enjoyed this computer-generated audio production of Off Limits Mate by Candace Ayers and Kim Dillon. The next book in this series is Protected Mate.